Lord every Wednesday night. Hey, hey, everyone. We are live Wednesday night on the Rec Yard Women's Prison Podcast. My name's Marcy Marie. Tunchi. Tunchi, hi. <laughs> what a day, honey. What a past couple of days I've had. What a whole week. Oh, my God. I'm so tired. I'm so tired. Wake wake up. It's part well, of you're gonna say it. You're gonna say past time. You're gonna say, wake your ass up. I stopped myself. Well, I said it. <laughs> Department of Corruption Stories is coming in hot. He's welcoming welcoming everyone in, reminding me to remind you guys to hit that like button, tap that screen, hit those hearts, comments. Please do share this live. And if you are listening wherever you hear your favorite podcasters, iHeartRadio, Apple Music, Spotify, wherever that might be, please do leave a review for us. We love those <laughs> and they help our podcast reach a greater audience. We see you at Shaquille Oatmeal, who's been, Shaquille's been rocking it with us since day one. That's right. I, honestly, I feel like she was at the first show. Uh, so we're just really happy to see you, Shaquille. We have people watching from our Linus Facebook page, our private group. I see Carrie S. Welcome, everybody. Guys, we have a really great show tonight. We are talking about some breaking news that happened this week regarding the Melissa Lucio case. Who is Melissa Lucio? Melissa Lucio is a woman who has been on death row since when, Toonch? Funny, it's for a, a while, time. for a yeah. good minute. <laughs> she was set time. to be executed 2021. Don't let me get the facts wrong, Toonchi. I'm just going to talk. Please don't let them correct me in the chat. Please correct me. <laughs> don't let me be the one. Don't. You're tired and you're leaving it to me, which is very scary. You're the detail well, person. I am. I am the detail person. Yeah. Um, Slap yourself in the face or something. <laughs> can, 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 it just reminded can, me like the time you left me when you were like, I need, I'm going to be sick. <laughs> yeah, we, we got to do something. Uh, Kim, I see you. Thank you for joining. Um, guys, my sister-in-law, Devin, is uh, is on the show. We're happy to see you, Devin. Um, Devin, Devin's in recovery, recent recovery, and she's rocking it. So hats off to you, Devin. We are all cheering you on for sure. So we're talking about the Melissa Lucio case. Um, she was... She was scheduled to be executed just in 2021, and that's actually, is it, was it 21 or 22, Toonch? 22. It was 22, yeah. It was 22. So um, that's actually how Linus, kind of the birth of Linus, really how it formed was she was sentenced to be death. She was sentenced to be murdered by the state. Just let's put it, put it out there. She was sentenced for execution and she um, didn't have a whole lot of people. She had some people rallying around her, but a lot of the women's organizations weren't. And some Linus girls got together and said, uh, we're going to fight for our sister in there. And they rallied behind her uh, execution date, Melissa Lucio ended up getting a stay. And thank God for that, because now there has been, it has been brought to light that favorable evidence, evidence that might have gotten her a not guilty verdict at her trial has been withheld. So that's, that's what we're talking about tonight. I'm really excited to dive into this case. Um, Tunchi knows a lot about Melissa Lucio's case. I've just kind of recently joined the campaign around her. Uh, there is a group of advocates uh, that we get together um, and, and just like we're looking for the right way. And we're also following the lead of Melissa's attorneys and her family, respecting all of that. So... <laughs> So before we get to all that, Toonch, let's do this. Toonchy, let's do a weekly recap. Hey, that was pretty smooth. 
<laughs> it's almost like we're getting used to this <laughs> this podcast thing <laughs> over a year. God, a right. year and a half. Right. Yeah. Uh, what What has been going on with you this past week? Oh my goodness. Um, had a lot going on this weekend. I, uh, me and Lori went, um, Lori's a friend of ours. We went, um, to another friend, Pamela Bryant. She had, um, an event. She was feeding unhoused folks and celebrating second chances because April is the designated second chance month, uh, for formerly incarcerated people. Uh, we couldn't stay the whole time because we had another thing to go, th- go to, which we, uh, watched a, a pretty interesting film uh, about advocacy with a group of parole advocates. And then I took off to Dallas, Marcy. Um, So I'm so tired. I went to a correctional um, education conference where I spoke on a panel and um, talked to people and got good information and put my boogie down about some advocacy stuff that we're concerned about. And uh, Drove back four and a half hours from Dallas because the roads were flooded and the traffic was bad. And um, it just took a lot <laughs> out of me, honey. It took you a lot sound beaten me. down. You sound beaten the hell down. No, because guess what? I woke up this morning at six and had to get on the road and drive an hour to um, a workshop slash conference for the Texas Juvenile Justice Department to tell my uh, journey, my youth journey. And it's my favorite presentation to do, but it's also the one that it really takes a lot out of me. It really, really does. Um, but I, I enjoy the medical director there. He has such a powerful presentation about trauma-informed care. Um, and it really gives the science behind my experience. And anyway, I was glad to do it, but that took a long time to get home. And then meetings and meetings. And I do, I feel like I've been run over <laughs> by a little at least a clown car, a small car. Well, and I think that people don't realize how much retelling of a traumatic event can take out of you emotionally, mentally, and, and make you physically tired. It takes a lot to be vulnerable and open yourself up about um, intense situations, a traumatic situations. So uh, I'm going to give you some grace. I'm not going to give you too much hell tonight. <laughs> so, no. And it was too, it was about 200 250. It was a lot of people at that education conference sitting in front of them. Um, it it's was- so odd. What's odd, Tunchi, is I haven't seen any pictures from the conference. I haven't seen any clips. You haven't sent me squat. Did you not have a camera on you? Your phone, your camera phone broke or what I happened? make a post. Did you not see the post with me and Alexa looking at the solar eclipse? But you wanted conference pictures. Of the conference. I, yes. Official I'll tell, pictures. Yes. I'll tell Alexa and Brandon to please send the pictures. Yes, please do. Uh yeah, I would love to I would love to see those. Our our week here has been good. Um I was I the only thing I can think about is last night. So I don't know. I don't remember what happened the rest of the week. Last night, I was rushed to the airport <laughs> for a last minute trip to um, another city here in Texas where I was supposed to testify at a trial, the sentencing part of the trial, as an expert witness on Texas women's prisons. Basically, what the real is, because I think a lot of times juries, they don't know, they know it's what three hots in a cot. Well, they get fed. They don't have any bills. You know, it's not so bad, but, but the, the uh, defender's office wanted the jury to have a clear picture. So I'm, I'm rushed. I'm frantic. I'm driving an hour into Dallas traffic. My flight's at five forty, So I, I'm at rush hour traffic. Um, but I did, I did stop at Kohl's to get this outfit (laughs) because I wanted to look professional and it's a great outfit. Uh, I wanted to look professional at the trial. Um, And so that maybe is what put me behind. I ended up missing my flight. So I missed missed my flight y'all. And I'm a little bit panicked because I'm getting paid for this one. So it is like a job I should be taking pretty seriously. Also, it's someone's life on the line, right? Um, 
So I, as I'm texting the attorneys, letting them know, please don't hate me. I am coming. You know, I'm just going to be five hours later than I originally thought. And I, I, I was a horrible, my, my alternative flight had a layover. It was ridiculous. Yeah. So then I, as I'm texting, they're texting me, Hey, we know you're probably on the plane. And I said, Oh, I hurried and called. And I said, I'm sorry. I just sent a text. I'm not on the plane. And they said, well, guess what? We don't, we don't need you to testify anymore because her, the lady's charges, their client's charges got dropped to a misdemeanor. And this lady has a son. And I just, I just cried openly right there. I thought about my family, what my family, what my kids went through because of my incarceration. And I, I just thought about all the trauma and everything that happens in prison and how hard it is at visitation and just the whole thing. And I just openly cried so that I feel like I'm on that, on this little bit of a high from that still celebrating for that. Um, yeah. And so that's what we've been doing, working and playing with kids and, um, family and, it's a good week. So <laughs> can I just say one thing about Are you your... if you're gonna say something about stopping at Coles on the way to the airport, I don't want to hear it. Okay. I won't I wasn't gonna say that, but I, I do want folks to know that um, Marcy was coming back from an event and she called me. She ran out of gas, literally, as she was <laughs> drifting off the side of the road, rolled into a gas station and had to have some ladies help push her vehicle over to the pump. And I said, did you not see the needle on the empty when you drove into Dallas from Weatherford? She said, I did. <laughs> I just, I know you saw the time when you walked into that <laughs> apartment store. I know you did. I know you knew the weather and it takes two or three hours to get through TSA. I just want to know what you were thinking. I was thinking I needed a jazzy outfit for court. <laughs> I picked it out really quickly. Listen, let's get to the meat of this show uh, and, <laughs> and let's just move on. We are talking about Melissa Lucio. We are talking about could her case get overturned. Shaquille Oatmeal just looked it up. Um, she she looked up Melissa on the TDCJ website. She was sentenced in 2008. I don't know how long she was incarcerated before her sentencing. Honestly, if she went to trial, it could have been two years. Um, so she has been incarcerated for a very long time. And there during her incarceration, there has been lots of people and advocates that have felt that she was innocent and Tunchi, you, you feel like she's innocent. Yeah. You yeah. And felt that. Yeah. Yeah. I really have. And um, so the case of Melissa Lucio is, you know, what we would say is an example of all the systems failing a family, right? The education system, the faith community, uh, the health uh, system and, you know, all of the systems failing her created this moment um, and then the legal system um, failing her ultimately at the end. And so her daughter had an accident. She had fallen down. The family, the kids and Melissa, you know, had said that she had fallen down um, a couple of steps um, outside the apartment. She seemed fine. Uh, she had a little bit of a, a physical disability where she kind of walked with a little bit of a gait, but baby seemed fine. Although Melissa had some concerns over the next two days that, you know, she wasn't feeling good. Baby was, you know, just kind of colicky and what have you. And um, then when they moved into their new place, uh, the baby um, went into crisis and uh died and so when the police came and it's it, it, the the cornerstone here is several things of of fault you know not just systems setting up her and her family for something like this but she was interrogated by the texas rangers 
Now, those of you that are not from Texas, you may be like, what are the Texas Rangers? They're this unique, special branch of law enforcement that is very seen as a very, it's a myth, like the you know, big cowboy hat and, oh, the Texas Rangers are coming. It's this big deal and all this history that is. They not- are the heroes of every old Western that's from that's ever been filmed or the set or the scene was in Texas, the Texas Rangers are yeah, there. They're the, the special investigators on the scene. And I can't even tell you how many cases that they've been involved in where they have duped something up so bad. There's another case uh, with Kelly um, who was charged with some child crimes, a football star out of the Austin area. And it was a Ranger that would, anyway, we'll have that show another time. But So the rangers were questioning her. She had not had sleep. She hadn't had food. Her child has just died. The interrogation is horrible. Um, And, you know, it goes to that thing like people are like, well, I don't understand why somebody would agree or say they did something that they didn't do. Well, when you are so vulnerable, right, and you're a woman who's experienced a lot of trauma and a lot of abuse from men. And, and you see his demeanor, just, it was just this perfect storm of, she was just like, okay, I, okay, yeah, okay. Like, you can see her shutting down, you can see her dissociating, you can see a trauma response. Those, those of us that know it, know it. And um, so they had offered her a plea bargain, Marcy, of about 30, or it might have been 35 years, and she said, no, I did not murder my daughter. I did not took it to trial and, um, ended up on death row. And, uh, there were, she, her attorney was garbage. Um, so many legal things were jacked up in her trial. And so she has maintained her innocence for over 15 years on death row. And, uh, when they issued an execution date, um, yeah, everybody just were like, no, (laughs) Uh, we're we're not going to let this happen, and we did our part um, to elevate it. We've had some really important Republican lawmakers, legislators that got on board and said, uh-uh, and there was a very bipartisan group that went to go visit her, Representative uh, Jeff Leach, who's a staunch conservative Republican in Texas. Um, uh, what is that other, like Lacey Hall? Uh, just, it was just, everybody was rallying. And it was gaining momentum, momentum. And DA signs, um, you know, was pretty stubborn. But at the two days before, the courts issued something and halted and she got to stay. Now, that has languished in the courts for 18 months, 16, 18 months. There's been no movement. And we just saw the... um, the articles from the Associated Press about this new development. Pretty incredible. It's really incredible. I You brought up Jeff Leach, and I'm mad at myself that I did not have that recording handy. Did you highlight that? <laughs> did you highlight that comment? Because I did not highlight that. Jen, your hair looks great tonight. Side note. Yeah. Melissa Lucio might get off death row. Yeah, that's Jen, it to celebrate. Your hair looks um, great. <laughs> that's why you fixed your hair tonight. Yes, <laughs> it's to celebrate. Yeah, we have a recording. Do you know where to find it easily or no way? You you start talking and I'll find it. Okay. <laughs> I know where to find it. You just start talking. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I'm I hope that you do and you sent me the link before. So I'm I'm upset with myself that I didn't. We have talked about Melissa Lucio before uh, we, I think we've had a whole other show about her maybe, or at least she was part of the conversation. So we were really excited to get this news and hear uh, we feel like, and this is just me talking. I feel like I'm rambling, but I will say that we feel like every woman in Texas who was incarcerated is, is part of our people. Those are our people. And we feel like Melissa is our people. And so to get this news, it was really huge. And uh, someone 
Shaquille Oatmeal had said a minute ago that she has watched some of the interviews with her family and how it was when she got her stay. If you Google her name, you will see lots of pictures of her and her family, um, Melissa's family's reactions, and they are very close. And she has other children and they have all rallied behind her saying you know, my, my mom wouldn't do that. My mom's not like that. My mom doesn't get angry with the kids. That's not it. And, and yet still, still at the trial, she was found guilty. So we're still on, we're still on mute. I see Mindy came in. Hi, Mindy. Um, I see, I'll, I'll just put this here too, uh, because I'm getting heckled for stopping to go shopping. Um, but Denise Scruggs here, she likes to heckle me. And so I'm used to it. Thank goodness I have pretty thick skin. <laughs> I do. I, I found it. Um, I found it on YouTube that people can listen to Representative Jeff Leach delivering the news two days, y'all. Two days before she was scheduled to die. Um, and so this is her reaction um, when uh, Rep uh, Representative Leach shares this with her. And I'll share my screen here, Marcy. We're acting like we've never used this tonight. We're in really... Honey, it's only been a year. Give <laughs> us a little grace. Give ourselves grace. <laughs> Let me open this up all the way so y'all can't see all the videos that I watch. <laughs> all right, here we go. And tell me if, we, if you can't hear it, because I can hear it. Well, we don't see anything. It went away. What did you do? You don't know? Guys, this is not our first show. This <laughs> isn't. And I'm having a, tired. a tough hey, time today. Hold are on, you getting it go. back on? I don't, am. Okay. All right. You want me to go. open it up? I'm ready now. I'm ready to rock and roll. Hey, Warden, this is State Representative Jeff Leach. Okay, hold on just a minute. Maybe get closer. I think we lost signal. Hold on just a second. Hello? Melissa. Yes? Hey, this is Jeff Leach. Yes, sir. How are you today? I'm doing fine. How are you? Good. Have you heard the news? No, what? You haven't heard the news yet? No, what happened? The Court of Criminal Appeals issued a stay of your execution for Wednesday. <laughs> we just got word about 15 minutes ago. <laughs> well, well, it means um, it means you're going to wake up on Thursday morning, um, and um, you're not you're not making the trip to Huntsville on Wednesday, and the um, the order was very strong in that you're gonna. It appears that you're going to get a new trial at the very least. They. Well, Melissa, I love you to death. There's a lot of really great people who've been working on this on your behalf. And just, I would say millions who've been praying for you. You know that. And um, um, it's been an honor to, um, to fight for you and believe so strongly in your cause. And of course, remember Mariah today. And I know you do as well. Um, but this isn't, the, this isn't the end. And uh, we're going to continue to work together to make sure that... Um, that the, that the right thing is done, and that hopefully, ultimately, you're free. That's the goal. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All Thank right. You. I'm going to come see you soon. Maybe maybe later this week or next week, I'll drop in and come see you. All right. I'll be waiting for you. Okay. Thank you so Love much. you, Melissa. Have a good day. I love you, too. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Oh, hey. <laughs> 
Wow. Wow. And and we've heard it a couple times. Carrie S. says, uh, and and now we're all crying. Devin's crying right now. It it's pretty it is pretty intense. Um I can't imagine mentally trying to prepare yourself for that that execution. Mentally trying to know that you're not ever going to speak to your family again, your kids, you have a close family and and just trying to be okay with that and then getting that phone call. Right? Because I I think that that she had hope, but she also had to know that that was, I mean, a possibility that that was very, very much, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, I've, I've talked to, to, to Pam before. She is um, a woman that was on death row for many, many, many years. And they commuted her sentence to life um, with parole. Uh, she, she didn't get out immediately. It was still a long time before they granted her parole. And she was two execution dates away, Marcy. One of them was the night before. And, um, you know, what, well, how do you, how is that not torture? You know, and, and especially when, when it was, a, you know, a, a child has, has, has died to hear all the, the terrible feedback and um, the judgment and the just the nastiness. You know how people are, or trolls are online, and just the the nastiness. But to be able to talk about her case and to really get people to look at the evidence and really open their mind to what really happened, people got it. They got it. Jeff Leach got it. Everybody got it. You know, and it was, you know how it is. It's it's when the court makes a mistake, it's really, they're very stubborn. And by the court, I mean, you know, local courts, um, DAs. It's, it's really hard to get them to move in the right direction of justice. I don't know if it's their pride or I don't know. They, they don't want to admit they made a mistake. But let's, let's take a look at this, what this um, happened this week. Well, I, before we get to that, I, I want to point out what Jeff Leach said, that you'll have another trial. He said that in that recording, and that was told to her. Mm-hmm. And what has happened? A year later, nothing has come up of that. She was still just dry sitting there. Mm-hmm. They were just sitting on it. The courts were sitting on it. And um, 16, 18 months later. <laughs> and um but I don't know if you want me to yeah. read this. I would love to read it. It's from the Associated Press here. Yeah, read it. And and Department of Corruption Stories is asking if we have spoke with Melissa personally. Um and so Melissa has a tight circuit of family that she corresponds with and her attorneys um and she gets lots and lots of mail. So we have not I have not. I don't know if she gets our newsletters. She does. Yes. Yeah. For the I, organization. I've exchanged emails with her. You know, I mean, we were at Mountain View together. And um, even though they're in a separate housing era, area and um, it's really hard to get access to them because like the girls in protective custody, they're they're kept away from general population. But those of us that are clerks and janitors and maintenance, um, we have some type of interaction, uh, with them, but yes, um, she does get our newsletter and, uh, I've told her before you were the inspiration behind this women's advocacy group. Um, but so this, uh, let me, let me read this to folks. Um, Melissa Lucio, Texas woman whose execution was delayed in 2022 amid growing doubts that she fatally beat her two year old daughter had evidence suppressed at her murder trial, according to prosecutors, in this case, as a part of an agreement on the findings, prosecutors and her attorney say the suppressed evidence includes witness statements, a report by Child Protective Services would have co- 
corroborated Lucio's defense that her daughter Mariah died of a head injury sustained in an accidental fall on a steep staircase two days before. Um, quote, um, uh, she would not have been convicted in light of the suppressed evidence. According to the 33-page agreement, remember that, y'all, agreement between the office of Cameron County District Attorney Lewis Sines and Lucio's attorneys. The document lays out what both sides say are agreed findings of facts and conclusions of law in this case. The agreement which recommends that Lucia's conviction and death sentence be overturned is being called unusual and extraordinary by one death penalty expert. But it has remained in limbo for 16 months before a Texas judge who has yet to say whether she will give it her approval and forward it to the state's highest criminal court, which would make a final decision. Honey, the DA and her attorneys wrote an, a shared agreement. 33 pages. 33 so pages. what is that judge waiting for? And I just want to say, y'all, when you, people that are looking, facing time and the DA and your attorney comes to an agreement, hey, uh, we're going to give her 20 years and uh, she's going to sign for it. Or like when, when the DA's office and the defender's office, whoever that is, private or public defender's office, agree on something. The judge usually just goes with what they've agreed on. Very rarely, I mean, I, I just don't understand what's taking so long. You know, it, it, you know, I think further on in the article, it talks about, you know, she wants to give it due diligence to really look at this report, really look at this agreement. And, you know, that's, that's fine. Um, but it's, I think, like I said earlier, this resistance by the state, the state as a whole, to reverse a mistake, right? Because I, I think the fear that the state has is that, well, if we acknowledge harm, if we acknowledge we were wrong, right, this undermines our credibility as the authority, you know? And, and so if it's anything that people can look and say, you're not, you know, omniscient, right? Like you're not God. The state is not all knowing, all powerful, all everything. If something puts a chink in that, that frightens them, which which the better thing to do to have the public's confidence is to admit a wrongdoing and a mistake and to rectify, right? The same way we have personal responsibility, like people respect you more when you're like, I made a mistake. Well, I don't know <laughs> if they're that angry. Sometimes they won't. But when you take accountability, right? You take accountability. Okay, this happened, and and frankly, they could have said, "Well, I mean, I'm just." They're not going to say this, but if a child lost their life in this case, so emotions do get the better of people, even professional people, even people that aren't supposed to show emotions or have emotions that that plays a factor into things. Yeah. And Marcy, what I didn't mention is that her uh, DA, DA signs is, was not her conviction trial, uh, you know, DA the, I can't remember his name, but he was, he was found to be doing wrongdoing. Like he was doing blackmailing extortion and all that kind of stuff. Right. And so you had him not doing what he was supposed to in her attorney, her trial attorney, my goodness, if y'all haven't, it, it's on Hulu. I believe it's still on Hulu. Um, but you can find it on streaming is the state of Texas versus Melissa. And it lays out her whole, the whole thing. And um, her attorney, the an interview that they have for her, her trial attorney, what an asshole. Right. Like he had, he said, well, she wouldn't even, it was like this, uh, she wouldn't participate in her own, you know, she didn't do that. Like he was just dumping all this fault on her. Right. And it's like, bro, I don't know what you know, what a um, traumatized woman who's been beaten and browbeaten by men her whole life, sexually abused, terrorized. What, what do you, what did you and think she was her child. Do? Yeah. And she, she just, just was like, her child. she said, I don't care. I don't, I'm just here, you know. And I mean, I'm just thinking about, 
my some of my lowest points of my in my life, my lowest times when I just didn't care what happened. I can just imagine that those were some of the feelings that she was having, even with her family at home. She was had all of this grief and sadness in her over the loss of her child and then past traumas on top of that. I mean, I can just imagine I have been in situations where I was low enough that I would have admitted to anything just to get just to go lay down and roll up into my dark space and be left alone. Like I, I I could have been that person. I could have been in that situation in that interrogation room, five hours into, into rough, harsh interrogation, not, not, well, talk to us about this. No, I'm talking about men hovering over. She probably felt, I mean, I'm just picturing it in my mind, the men that have hovered over me and, uh, abused their size and authority and power. And I felt feeling their spittle on your face and feeling their hot breath on you and them, just barking at you. I can imagine she would have said anything to get that to stop in that moment. Uh, and, and then go to trial and not be much of an able to participate. I mean, not be able to mentally or physically or emotionally be able to participate in that. Well, it was interesting, right? Like the, the, the talk I gave today and, and the gentleman that does the trauma informed care presentation, uh, he talks about the brain science of trauma, uh, you know, and he says, well, what happens with with trauma and the way it affects the brain, especially the younger you are when the trauma happens, which we know Melissa was very young when hers started as well and then continued into adulthood, is that whenever you're triggered, right, whenever your brain has that trigger, Right. He gives the example of, you know, you're little and you're playing with your sister and your mom's cooking spaghetti and your dad comes home and beats her and beats y'all. And this happens a couple of times, even if it's just one time you're older and you smell spaghetti sauce or you smell, uh, you know, ragu or whatever. And you're like, I feel an eat like you don't even consciously remember, but your brain, your body. There's a great book about the body keeps the score. Your brain remembers it. And so he says, you know, it's the uh, brain stem and your your what they call the reptile brain, like in the middle. It's your it's your uh, survival brain, right? It's activated anytime that happens. Fight, freeze, or flee. And so when people are triggered, they immediately go there. Marcy, you and I, all of our friends, when we get triggered, we go right there. So this frontal. Right. Where all your reasoning is, your judgment, your focus is immediately disengaged because it is no good for fight, freeze or flee. And so, you know, like sometimes when you and I are even upset about something and we're triggered and one of us is talking to the other and we're just both dissociated. You're like, I haven't heard a word you've said, not a word of it. Right. And that is the science behind why, because you are activated in that part of your brain that is on survival. So trauma in, in trauma responses that remind, that remind you of that trigger this. So I can see it. it. You can see it in the interrogation. You could see it through her trial. All of that is activated. And that's where she's thinking and living right inside of that very primal place in our brain, because this cannot be activated. It can't. That's brain science. And that is the science of trauma. And to 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 watch that play out in her in, in uh when they're in what's the word interrogate interrogate him so sorry uh, you can see it you can see the dissociation you can see it and um, and to to see her attorney treat her the same way it to to talk about her in the same way and and so this is what the gentleman uh, that presented on trauma talked about the kids in the youth system he said. <laughs> You're, oh, you won't listen. Look how this kid didn't do what I offered. And, and and they just rejected all the good stuff we're offering them. And they're behaving like this. Well, you're putting the blame on the child when they're in survival mode. Of course, they don't care. They're not. They don't know. It's on you. Right. It's on the attorney. It's on the D.A. It's on the judge when you're dealing with someone that has such a, a big trauma history. And you made the comparison to juveniles, but this is 
absolutely 100% happens in adults as well. Uh, I mean, we experience that in prison with I mean, I want to say 100% of everyone I spoke to in prison had a, a trauma response. I, I I mean, I can't say for certain 100%, but it, it felt the numbers high enough that I feel almost confident to say 100%. Um, that disassociation or somebody that takes something and, you know, have you ever been in conversation with someone and you said something very casually and not aggressive and not meaning to be aggressive and they just barked back at you and immediately went into went into fight mode went into attack mode that's that's a a visceral response is that the right Uh word for that Uh yeah yeah you know and and it's i think you know we're at a place now that we we do understand those things more and more right and to see them rooted in science um And here this woman has been accused of murdering her own child, you know, because she's and and this is what made it easy for that that trial court. Marcy is because she had struggled with addiction because they lived in poverty. They were often unhoused. Right. And she um, has a lot of children. and, And so they would go from place to place. Sometimes they were sleeping in the park. But what CPS said is that these children are never without clothes or food. They're not malnutrition. Melissa cared for those kids with the best that she had. And they all all those children, those children were were questioned too. And they were like, our mother does not know. That's not that didn't happen. Our sister failed. And it was like they had the evidence of it. They had the the things that would corroborate that. And they suppressed them. They kept the witness statements, Toonch. Who were the witnesses? We don't know because they haven't released that her kids. It was her kids? Her kids. It was the CPS workers. It was, um, you know, uh, pretty much uh, the way she said this happened, people could corroborate that. And and nobody, and so they just did, and there was, I believe, one of her kids that was going to testify, and the attorney did not call them. So it was suppression from the, from the defense attorney and from the DA because of, of, and two, it goes to that thing that we talk about as women and moms, we're held to a standard that is completely unrealistic and and judge. So when women are angry or they struggle with addiction or they struggle in poverty, if they're not the perfect mom that by society standards, they're demonized, they're whores, they're liars, they're violent, they're all these things because they're they uncaring. They may as well, they may, they don't care about their kids. They don't want to be a mom. They, right. all of those things, they don't love their kids. Right. All of those things. I have heard all of those things. And, and that is what happened to Melissa Lucio. You know, all those systems failed her when she needed support and she was looking for help and support and doing the best that she could. And her family was doing the best they could. And then this happens. And then it was the ultimate failure. She ends up on death row. Not just sentenced, right. not just sentenced to prison. Um, and you you threw the number out there 15 years, but we're at 25 years, Tunchi. If 2008, if Shaquille was looking at the right thing. Oh she's yeah, saying, don't judge my math. <laughs> yeah, uh, twenty five. What's going on? Yeah, twenty five years she's been. Um, I want to talk a little bit about you about what a death row looks like. What does it look like to do time in death row? Um, and you were at the unit. You did quite a bit of time on the unit where they house women in Texas who are sentenced to death. Can you kind of describe what what that looks like for them? Sure. Yeah. So death row um, for the women um, at Mountain View, Patrick O'Daniel unit. Um, It used to be in the building that is now protective custody and visitation. And back in the 80s, and, you know, Pam talked a lot about this with her and Carla Faye Tucker and and Betty that, you know, they had this was the days of crocheting and artwork and and having a very home like structure. They could they were housed together. They Yeah, they did all that, you know. Well, when the late 80s, early 90s came, 
when they painted everything over with gray and stripped us of everything, of everything, right? It's kind of going back in the other direction, but they took them out of that building and put them in a new building that was added on um, over there by SEG. And it's called the MPF facility, multiple pur uh, purpose facility. And so the two wings up front are, um, or one wing, I'm sorry, it's kind of a shoe like that, is for, I think that you've been there, right? Like the observation, <laughs> the observation, the cells that, that, that are for folks that are in mental health crisis. Now in the back, you go down this little hall and I would, I was working in risk management at the time and he had to go do readings, sound readings and lighting and all this stuff, because let me tell you something, there are certain rules around death penalty, uh, the death penalty and people who are incarcerated under the death. There has to be a certain amount of lighting and, and sound and all this other stuff. Anyway, so he was in there doing that. And there was, um, uh, the, the girls had a day room that they could go to together to do some work, which is often like um, uh, we had the craft shop that the older ladies would do special projects like little dolls or whatever that they would sell. The unit would sell. So the death row girls would do like the little strips of fabric or, or you know, like little menial things to support the special project girls. And so that because yes, y'all, they had scissors. They had scissors. Now they weren't stab you in the neck scissors. They were like paper scissors, you know. But they could cut yarn. Not in the in your scissors. Yeah, scissors for first graders. <laughs> they got in trouble because they were trimming each other's dead ends. And they oh, it was a big fucking thing. They're getting each other's just you know how they overreact to all the stuff that women do. Um, but that was the only time they ever really got in trouble as a group. Um, and then they had a little strip next to that dorm that was the rec yard. Um, and that's kind of blacked out on the fencing where you can't really see them. Um, but they were able to have a little bit of time together. Now they have the tablets. Now they have TV. Um, because one of the things that the, the Jeff Leach just was really appalled at, right? Because and I think this is because people don't understand this. The absolute lack of human contact. These people have not had a contact visit with their family, have been able to hug their children or their family. They can't because of death row. And he just was like, I, I can't believe um, that that's a thing, right? But the cell, I remember walking into that cell, Marcy. And I felt like I was walking into a submarine. It was the tiniest incubated little cell and I've been in a lot of cells <laughs> unfortunately jail cells juvenile cells um old cell blocks it felt like a little sub it was so small to me and there was this little tiny strip of a window at the top and um I just remember standing there waiting on my boss in this empty death row cell and I was like I can't even imagine living here 24 hours a day with this, it, with this, knowing that I'm just waiting to die. Um, it depressed me. I, I really, it really affected me more than any other cell I've ever walked into. And I, I think I'd have felt that way even if I hadn't known it was a death row cell because the structure of the cell felt so suffocating. And still, somehow, those ladies figured out how to have community with each other. And we hear stories. And when you talk about Pam, I did time with Pam. She was my very good friend on the Dr. Lane Murray unit after her death sentence got lifted and she ended up with the, with the life sentence. Um, and she talks about the way that they came together was just the same way that we all came together in general population, in SEG, in medium custody, uh, just the same way the human, the, that human instinct or whatever it is to connect, it, it's so powerful that it still, it still happens even on death row, even when you are in a hopeless, dark place, you find hope through the other ladies. Yeah. And, and they have, uh, you know, over the past two or three years, certainly been given more, 
um, freedoms within the row. Uh, I know the men's death row uh, now has a seminary program, but they have some type of program that they're able to go to the door to a door. Like that was just unheard of in the past. And, and, you know, those things are great, Marcy. They're, they're wonderful. Um, and you, was it, I think it, maybe it was Alexa yesterday when someone was praising something about, you know, oh, this person with life sentence is able to do this thing. And she's like, yeah, but they're still in prison. Oh no, but they're able to do this thing and it makes them happy. She goes, yeah, they're still in prison. <laughs> I like all those things are great. And I'm so happy for them that they have more, um, autonomy and, and community and, and, and that helps. But at the end of the day, these women are on, um, they're waiting for the state of Texas to kill them. God. I don't even, what, what can I say after that sentence? I don't and even... I remember I was at the, the Capitol. There was that group of us that was um, advocating in, uh, in front of the governor's office at the Capitol. And um, we were just waiting around and um, I didn't expect myself to be this emotional. I, I think I've gotten more uh, softy <laughs> over the past couple of years, but I think I was just so caught up in, okay, what's next? What's next? Okay. we got to do this and this and this that when um, the gentleman with death penalty action, he, he said, they just announced it. She's got to stay. The court just announced it. And um, a guy who was a, a friend of ours at the time was standing near me. And I just started sobbing, Marcy. It just, it, it's, a, I just, it was like a vow. Like it just exploded. And I, he could tell I was fixing. I just, I lost uh, like all, I just turned to jelly and he kind of caught me and he just hugged me and held on to me. And I sobbed because it was like, for the first time through the past three months of, of doing all this, it was like, really, it just really sunk in emotionally that they were going to kill someone that I know, a, a unit I did time with who was considered a friend, a formerly incarcerated woman, one of us, right? Like this isn't some person you see on TV or some faraway news thing. This could have very well been Pam or you or me or Mandy or, or, or anybody, right? Like she is one of us, like you said. And what would have that? And, and, I, and I, I remember thinking, oh God, what am I going to do if we have to drive to Huntsville? It, it became very, I guess I... I don't know. I just didn't realize how much I was holding in because she symbolized all of us. And that's real. That's not some bullshit you see on TV. That's real. And I don't give a what anybody's charge is on that death row. I don't care. They're one of us and I'm a protest and, and, and lose my mind over every single one of them. I just, uh, we went to that conference, the Abolish the Death Penalty, I don't remember their acronym, or, um, and Tierra Cooper, who is also a Linus member, who is also a formerly incarcerated lady, um, she just said, I, I don't want the state killing people in my name. They, they don't have the right. Uh, I just, the, the whole thing. And then the fact that they could be innocent, you know. Uh, Stephen Parker, Department of Corruption Stories, said, I'd love to protest and stand with y'all. And, and he does his own protesting in his state, quite a bit of prison reform work up there. And we love you. We thank you for your support. Tunchi, so what's next for Melissa? Well, she's just waiting to see what this judge does. If, if she sends this, um, you know, this on to the uh, higher courts. Um, the higher courts indicated that that's what they wanted to happen uh, when they stayed her execution. And so maybe this is what she was waiting on. Right. And, um, and then it, it'll just be a matter of step one, two, three. Um, you know, it was kind of a, a thing that when we um, 
Saul Rosa uh, released and, and Hannah and, and other folks. It, it's just a process after that. Uh, I, I have good faith that the courts, now they have this agreement between the DA and the attorney. Mm -mm. I, I think this is just, we, we thought stuff wasn't happening, but we know behind the scenes over the past 16, 18 months, this has been ongoing um, to dig into um, and done the right way this time. So it's just a matter of time. When people, we don't know if this is looking like an exoneration. We don't know if this is looking like a new trial. Um, right. Exoneration, right. You, you could possibly get compensated. Sure. Prison. It, it, I mean, it depends on, right? Like the, the court could issue, Hey, she, she, she gets, she should have a new trial. And the DA say, it says, uh, we're not going to try you. We're going to drop the charges or we're going to drop the charges down to, I don't know, neglect or an injury to a child or something. I, I still don't, I mean, Melissa's kind of made it clear that, um, she's not accepting any of that because she said it was an accident and I did not purposely harm my child. And um, so it would, it would be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, but yeah. I mean, they could just declare her innocent that, I mean, that's a little bit tougher. It doesn't happen as often, but um, this doesn't happen often either. So we'll see. Well, we will be watching and we will be uh, keeping you guys updated as developments happen in the Melissa Lucio case. We are uh, really happy to see everybody tonight. Uh, we see you in the chat. We thank you for your support. We thank you for commenting, liking, sharing the live. If you're listening to us, please do leave us a review. We appreciate you guys. and. Um, Tunchi, any final thoughts? Are you looking at the time? Did you just cut your eyes at the time? No, I, didn't. I was looking at the private group to see who all was making uh, comments. And I, hey, look, um, Hannah's here watching. Hey, Hannah. Oh, <laughs> Hannah. oh, well, I didn't know. And look, the it said, hi, Marcy. I love oh, you. That's, I'm that's Rosalinda. That's Rosalinda, oh. though. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. See, all three of those came back to back. So I thought it was the same person. Yes, and so Rosalinda. because I thought it was the same person, it felt weird because <laughs> oh. it was, hi, Marcy. I love you. I'm watching. <laughs> and I thought, let me just pass on over that. <laughs> well, look who's watching. Yeah, it did make me nervous. My and so let me just flash Brittany up here. She is here. My wife is here. Whoever's watching, Hannah Overton. We we were we did mention you in this case. And um, do you just want to just very quickly, Tunchi, because we're at the end of our hour. Mm -hmm. Talk just very quickly. Can you can you recap Hannah Overton's case in sixty seconds? She was accused of harming um, a child with salt. Mm -hmm. It was ridiculous. It, a powerful Texas Monthly article about her case. And she was, she never wavered um, in her faith and her spiritual faith and in her innocence. And um, yeah, she won her appeal. She was given. Hannah, I think, wasn't it life without parole? It was bad. And, and it was ridiculous so what they did to this woman and her family. And they held, held steady with their faith. And um, they won, she won her appeal. And she's home now advocating for ladies inside, supporting ladies inside, collecting shampoo and things that women in prison need. <laughs> and I was still in prison when uh, Hannah's um, ministry was sending in those goodies. And I think you were too, Toonch. Right, you so were was, honey, the first time I got that package and it had the little, little card in it from Syndigo Ministries, I sat down on my floor and wrote a letter. I said, I think this is Hannah Overton. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Uh, yeah, I would write Hannah's uh, ministry every once in a while just to say thank you so much. It was so. And when we oh, got yeah. those packages, we would all be, we'd be like, thanks, Hannah. Thank yeah. you, Hannah. Thank you, Hannah. Because well, we knew. We knew the yeah. first time we got them and they're like, oh, well, it says Syndigo Ministries. And it was everything that we needed. Everything. And good quality. And abundance. 
And I said, mm, this some this is a formerly incarcerated. This is Hannah, y'all. This is Hannah. <laughs> this is somebody that knows what it's like. Yes. Thank you, Hannah. Thanks everybody for watching. We appreciate you guys so much. I'm I'm tearing up again. I'm just what's going on with me. I just love you all so much. Uh, my favorite hour of the week is right here with you guys. And we will be here next week, same time, same place, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. I will ask Tunchi to fix her hair again before the next episode. Oh, look because it, look, it looks really good tonight, even though and I <laughs> bad in the face. <laughs> even though you're feeling crazy. Oh. We will see you guys next time. For hanging out with us on the Rec Yard Women's Prison Podcast.